This morning we're in 2 Corinthians, which um, doesn't sound like it would be the book we would turn to for a sermon dealing with the nativity, but uh, I think you already know why I've chosen this um, particular passage, 2 Corinthians 8, uh, verse 9. It was our memory verse, and I have been making reference to it a number of times already this morning. But let me, uh, let me read for you this passage in the context because I am going to make just a, a few comments on the context in the sermon and why it is that Paul is pointing to Jesus in the first place. Now, we're not going to be focusing on the reason why Paul is pointing to Jesus Christ, but we are going to be looking at that example he points to and realize what it is, again, that our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us because really the, the nativity, the gospel, everything is wrapped up in that one verse. But let's read 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 9. This is what Paul writes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God, which was given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much entreaty for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Consequently, we urge Titus that as he had previously made a beginning, so he would also complete in you this gracious work as well. But just as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all earnestness and in the love we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. I am not speaking this as a command, but as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love also. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding this morning. Let me just simply point out that Paul is um, encouraging the, the saints at Corinth to do the same thing the saints in Macedonia had done, and that is to contribute to the needs of the saints in Jerusalem. And pointing out to them, of course, the greatest example of our Lord Jesus Christ and of his, his giving, of his impoverishing himself in order to help other people. Now, what I want to just simply point out from this is this, that when we understand what the Lord has actually done for us, that should encourage us to do likewise. And not just in this area. I didn't choose this because you know, it was a, a text about uh, giving of money, but it's a giving of ourselves what the Lord wants us to do. Our Lord Jesus Christ gave of himself. I mean, his condescension, his entire ministry was not for his benefit, but it was for the benefit of others. So the sacrifice of Christ should make a very powerful difference in our lives. We are called to follow that same example he left us. Now, I, I think I've already kind of hedged on my introduction here because, again, in our passage, this is what Paul is doing. He is encouraging the church of Corinth to give, to contribute to the needs of the saints in Jerusalem. And again, the reason being is because, and he'll mention elsewhere in this letter, that as the Corinthians who were Gentiles had shared in their blessings, which were spiritual because it was in the Jewish race that Jesus Christ came, and that's where the work of salvation was worked out, but now it's being sounded throughout the world. And of course, Gentiles are coming into the kingdom as well. As they have participated in these Jewish blessings, now they were to share of their blessings, as it were, in the material realm to help those who were in need. So again, he begins by pointing to the example of the saints in Macedonia. They were going through a very difficult time themselves. They were deeply impoverished, Paul says, but they still gave, and they gave joyfully, he says, even beyond what they were actually able to give. I would imagine for their own existence, not that they were going to kill themselves, but let's just say that they gave beyond the comfort zone. 
considering that this sacrifice of their resources was a much more precious thing to do than anything they might have hoped to gain by holding on to them. These churches not only gave, but they begged Paul for the opportunity to give. And Paul was urging the Corinthians that they were to do the same. So to urge the Corinthians, he was pointing to the example of the saints in Macedonia. But Paul had an even greater example that he could point to, to encourage them in this important work in their giving. And that was to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because who has ever even come close to making the kind of sacrifice that he made? Though he was rich, Paul says, yet for your sake he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. Now this is certainly the greatest gift that God has ever given. God has given tremendous gifts. Everyone in the world has enjoyed the goodness of God. The fact that they even exist and have anything good at all comes from his hands. But that's nothing compared to what God has given in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just to the Corinthians, of course, but to all mankind, to all who will believe in him. Because the Bible says whoever will receive Jesus Christ and believe on him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And of course, that's what we want to consider this morning. Now, at this time of year, as we prepare to give our gifts to those that we love and care about, let's consider the greatest gift that has ever been given, the gift which God gave through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, I want us to look at three things. Our text divides itself up quite easily. That is, that Jesus Christ was rich, yet he became poor for your sakes, that thirdly, through his poverty, you might become rich. So first of all, let's consider that Jesus Christ was rich. What did Paul mean by this? Well, as you know, in our culture, uh, riches can be measured in a variety of ways. Uh, people can be rich in friends. So people who have many friends or have a great deal of influence are said to be rich. People who have great talents and are able to do great things are considered to be rich in a certain way. Those who have great intellects and can think of things or write things that can influence other people. Those who possess great wisdom. And again, all of these things conspiring to influence other people. How to win friends and influence people. A person who can do that is considered to be not only talented, but wealthy. But I think the way that wealth is most often measured in our culture is in the possessions that a person has. If a person owns a great deal of property, they have a large bank account, maybe large investments in stocks, or possess precious metals or gems, they're said to be rich. Now, if we measure Jesus by this standard, how rich would he be? And I should say, if we measured him in, in his original state, as it were, as the Son of God in, in eternity. And here we're, we're getting into a little bit of a, um, an area that could use a bit of explanation because we do know that as the Son of God, Jesus Christ never changed. When we get to his impoverishing himself, it's not that the Son of God changed, but it's what he took to himself and the state in which he came into this world. But let's consider what he was like prior to that with regard to his riches. And again, first of all, we need to understand who it is that Jesus Christ is, and that is God. The Bible says that this one, this Jesus, before he became a man, existed eternally as God. By the way, I should mention that you have to believe that in order to receive the true Jesus Christ. There are many Jesuses that are preached in the world, but the true Jesus is the one who is God as well as man. The Bible says he existed eternally as God. Paul writes in Philippians 2, verses 6 and 7, Although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. This one is in the form of God. He is the one who is equal with God. Uh, the word was God, as uh, John tells us in John chapter 1. Well, this one was God. So how rich is God? 
Well, by any standard, he is infinitely rich, especially when it comes to wealth, which to God is, is meaningless. I mean, he's the one who actually created all these things. As God, Jesus actually owns the entire world and all of its wealth. He owns all the precious metals. He owns all the gems. He owns all the resources, including those things which seem to be particularly important to um, Karl Marx and other communists. He's the one who actually possesses and owns the laborers and their tools. He owns absolutely everything. Now, you need to realize that the things that you have actually don't belong to you, but they belong to him. And you don't belong to you. You actually belong to him as well. The Lord who owns you actually only allows you to use your life and the things that you possess to see what it is that you will do with those things, to see whether or not you're going to use them for his glory or whether you're going to use them for your own glory. You see, that's the struggle that we as believers have every single day. Are we going to use our lives for his glory? Are we going to use them for our own? Are we going to use our possessions to have more fun for us? Are we going to use our possessions to give more glory to God? By the way, the Lord tells you that one day, uh, each one of you, myself included, all of us, are going to have to give an account to him personally for how we use our lives, how we use our possessions. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I hope that raises a level of concern, at least in some degree, in every single one of us, because God is going to hold us accountable. There is a day of accounting where we're going to have to, uh, well, everything we've done will be judged by him. Paul was concerned, and that's the reason why he went on to say in the next verse, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, that's exactly what we're trying to do as we go out caroling, as we seek to um, share Jesus Christ with others, to preach the gospel or to bear witness to it. We're trying to persuade men because there is a day of accounting that is coming. And we don't do that just so we can deliver ourselves on that day, since the Lord does say, you are my witnesses. And I want you to tell other people about Jesus Christ. We do need to be faithful with that uh, charge that's been entrusted to us. But we should be concerned about the other person as well. He has to give an account. She has to give an account. And apart from Jesus Christ, they cannot give a good account. And they are going to be condemned. We need to use what the Lord has given to us in order to persuade others others. But the point backing up now a couple of steps is this. Everything that you have, yourself included, belongs to Jesus Christ. All the wealth of the world belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was rich. He was actually infinitely rich because he owned not only this planet and the things that happen to be in this world, but he owns countless planets within the universe. He has the wealth of a universe, not just a galaxy. You know how big a galaxy is, right? Well, there are billions of galaxies in this universe. The Lord owns them all. And if it wasn't enough, he could create billions more because he has the ability to speak into existence whatever he desires. That is how rich this one is if we counted it merely on the basis of material wealth. We know he is rich in, in many other ways to an infinite degree of intelligence and of wisdom, of knowledge, and every other way that we would count riches. But Paul goes on to say that it's this one who is so rich that became poor for your sakes. Now, how did one who was so wealthy suddenly become so impoverished? It was by his becoming a man. Again, we go on to read in Philippians chapter 2 that after he, Paul tells us he existed eternally as God, he goes on to say that he emptied himself. Taking the form of bondservant 
and being made in the likeness of men, not just the likeness of men, he became an actual man. Now, that would be a big enough stoop, I think, by itself. I mean, that's an infinite stoop. We have really nothing to compare it to. If a man became an amoeba, which is a single cell organism, which doesn't think, it just sort of exists and lives and does certain things, makes you sick if you happen to ingest them, okay? That kind of a stoop is nothing compared to what Jesus did when being God, he became man. The one who is the infinitely blessed and, and uh, well, perfect and infinitely glorious and wealthy creator became one of his creatures. Now, again, that's not the totality of his stoop, but that is a very large portion of it. But he not only became a man, he became the lowliest of men. He became not just one of his creatures in, in a humiliation, we might say, that we can't even imagine what it was like. But in becoming one of his creatures, he became one of the lowest of his creatures. Now, Jesus wasn't born in a king's palace, was he? He didn't become the son of the, the most powerful ruler of his day. But he became the son of a humble carpenter and his wife. We already read that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary, and he was born of her before she and her husband came together. Uh, Joseph kept her a virgin until she gave birth to the son. So Joseph is not the father, but he is the adopted father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was born into his household, and he was raised as a carpenter. And he labored as a carpenter, presumably, for the first 30 years of his life. That is not what we would consider to be a mark of success or of greatness. This was humiliation. The one who was rich became poor. And then when the Lord Jesus Christ ministered for those three and a half years, by today's standards, he did not become a great success. He did not build a megachurch, did he? He didn't have throngs of people following him. Well, he did for some period of time, at least while he was doling out the goodies and doing miracles to make everybody marvel. But he didn't have money, people throwing money at him. They weren't collecting the bag, as it were, but he actually had uh, uh, this group of, of ladies who were fairly well-to-do that followed him and helped provide for their needs. And the money bag, that what little money was in it, was being pilfered by Judas. What Jesus basically had were the clothes on his back. So by today's standards of wealth, he was poor. Now, again, even by today's standards of popularity, he wasn't that popular. He was for a while. He had his time of popularity while he was, as it were, uh, making people marvel at what he was able to do. But as he continued to preach the truth, he made more and more enemies, especially among the leaders of Israel. But you know, when it came time to um, when he was put on trial, the vast majority of Israel called out for his death. So Jesus didn't come on the earth as a great king or a great leader. He basically came as one who serves. And even in his leadership of his apostles, it was not that he might lord it over them so that he could be someone great with these servants under him, but he stooped to serve them throughout his ministry. And when it came time for the last meal that Jesus was to share with them, when they came in off the dusty street in order to prepare for the meal, it wasn't the disciples that got down on their hands and knees, as it were, and washed Jesus' feet, but he tied the towel around himself and took the bowl of water and stooped down before them. And he washed their feet. Jesus became a servant. The one who was rich became poor. And Jesus served them even in his death. As a matter of fact, he served us too. After he was arrested and put on trial, he was condemned. And they sentenced him to die on a cross. This punishment was actually the very worst that criminals could endure. And as far as an Israelite was concerned, to be hung on a cross or to be hung on a tree was to be considered cursed by God. Paul writes in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. 
Now, was it just circumstances that uh, our Lord Jesus Christ died on a cross? No. He died on the cross to show us exactly what he was doing for us because in his humiliation and in his great impoverishing, as it were, he actually reached the very depths by becoming not a rich man in this world, having been God, but by becoming one cursed by God on the cross. And of course, the fact that he was cursed wasn't because he had done anything wrong. But Paul says that he was cursed for us. He became cursed in our place. And of course, that's what we're getting to in the final point, why it is that Jesus did what he did. But again, the one who was infinitely rich became the poorest, the very poorest of all men. And the reason that he did was that you might become rich. Now, does Paul mean to say that Jesus became impoverished so that you and I might become materially wealthy? I mean, are the health and wealth people right here? That uh, Jesus came so that we could have the Cadillac, or no, the Cadillacs aren't so popular anymore, but maybe the Mercedes, or you know, if you're in a sports car, the Lamborghini, or whatever it is that you might want to have, these very expensive cars, live in palaces, and have all those things that Jesus Christ didn't have? Did he give up all this wealth to make you rich in that sense? No, he didn't actually. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that those kinds of things to the Lord are worthless. And he gives them mostly to people of the world who desire those things and who are going to perish with those things. God has promised to meet your needs physically if you seek first his kingdom, but he hasn't promised to make you rich in that sense. And yet, he did promise to make you rich through the poverty of Christ. Now, in order to understand how it is that the Lord can make you rich, you first need to understand how it is that you are poor. I mean, you can be the richest person in the world and still be poor in the sense we're talking about now, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. When you came into the world, you were already poor towards God. As far as being acceptable to God, you were absolutely bankrupt. The first person God ever created, whose name was Adam, he put in a garden to represent you in a particular trial, in a particular test, and in that test, he failed and rebelled against God. And because he did, he brought to you and to me a negative balance in our account, an infinite debt that you could never pay. He made you guilty. He made you sinful. And since you've come into the world, you've done nothing except make that debt even greater. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, the Bible says there is none who does good. There is not even one. Every single thing that you and I have done since we've come into the world has done nothing but add to that debt. And of course, the Bible says that that debt is one that can only be paid by death. The wages of sin is death. And it's not just physical death, although sin is the reason why we die physically. But it is spiritual death, it is judicial death, it is death that is satisfied by an eternity of agonizing suffering in a lake of fire. That is what you and I deserve as we come into the world. That is what you and I have deserved over and over again through every sin that we have committed. That is our debt. We are poor, spiritually poor. And if you die with this debt, you will have to repay it throughout the rest of eternity in God's judgment. But Jesus came, the Bible says, Paul tells us, to make you rich. His poverty, his humiliation, and his death can not only cancel out your debt, but his righteousness can make you wealthy, spiritually wealthy. You know, while Jesus lived on this earth, he built up, as it were, wealth, a wealth of pure obedience, something which is far more precious than gold. Believe me, on the day of judgment, money will not help you. You can have the riches of the world. You can offer them to God on the day of judgment to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he won't think anything of it. 
except, of course, you wouldn't have it in your possession to give to him anyway, but if you did, it would be just a bribe that would not move this righteous judge at all, especially considering he has the wealth of a universe at his disposal. But I'll tell you, there is one thing that will be precious to you on that particular day, and it is the riches which Jesus can give you. That is the riches of his righteousness. The Lord tells you that if you will turn from your disobedience, if you will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he will not only cancel your debt, again, which is an infinite debt to God's justice, but he will give you his righteousness. He will make you rich. And on the day of judgment, you will not be condemned. You will not be cast into hell forever into the lake of fire. But this righteousness will open a door for you, a door that is that of his eternal kingdom. The Lord will receive you as his child. He will bring you into his kingdom, which will last forever. And there, the Lord says, you will have no more pain. You will have no more sorrow. And you will live forever in perfect peace, in perfect happiness, in perfect blessedness. This blessing which he gives will last forever, unlike the things of this world, which even if you can get them, you have to let go of when you die. So though Jesus was rich, he chose to become poor that through his poverty, you might become rich. To put that in terms of how we understand it in the gospel, the eternal son of God became a man through his obedience and through his death on the cross, you might be saved and have an eternal inheritance in heaven. That is the reason why Jesus Christ came into the world so many years ago. Now, the only thing this passage doesn't actually tell you outright is this, and that is what do you have to do in order to receive the riches that the Lord Jesus came to bring? It's not something the Lord gives to everyone. It doesn't become yours automatically. You know, it's not like he comes into the world and everybody becomes his recipient suddenly. And on the other hand, it's not something that you have to work for in order to get. The Lord doesn't tell you to climb the highest mountain or to make the greatest sacrifices or to do X, Y, and Z, keep his law perfectly, and then he's going to give it to you. You just simply need to receive it like a gift. You know, we all know what gifts are at Christmas time. Uh, we know it's more blessed to give than to receive, but I think most of us do get gifts too. But when you get a gift, somebody gives you a gift and says, Merry Christmas, you don't say, well, wait a minute, let me get my wallet out. How much do I owe you for that? You know, no, it's, that's not what a gift is, right? A gift is, I bought this for you, and I'm giving it to you freely. Well, that's exactly what this gift is like. The Lord purchased it through his infinite humiliation and condescension, and he offers it to you as an absolutely free gift. All you have to do is receive it. Uh, when the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? He was saying, what must I do to receive this gift that the Lord has brought? What do I have to do? And they said to him, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's all you have to do. That's not even a work, really. What it is is a looking to Jesus Christ and receiving from him what he is offering to you in the gospel. What Paul and Silas were saying is he offers to give it to you freely. All you have to do is receive it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You not only have to believe that these things are true, but you actually have to look to Jesus Christ and place your whole hope of heaven on him. It's like this. He stands there in the gospel as he basically right now is offering it to you. And he says, I will give you life freely. Just receive it. Just trust me. Just place your whole hope of heaven on me. That's Jesus, of course, not me. Jesus. And he will save you. He will give you life. Now, of course, the Lord says you must also turn from your sins because the reason why Jesus Christ came into this world was to break the power of sin, to set you free from your slavery to it, 
And he tells us that every single person who receives this grace of the gospel, their lives are transformed so that they begin to live the kind of life that the Lord calls them to live. As a matter of fact, John reminds us in 1 John 3, by this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. The one who practices righteousness is born of God. The one who practices sin is of the devil. So if you are to be saved, you, you must turn from your sins. And that's the way you can also know that you have been saved. That the Lord has had mercy upon you. Is that you are turning from your sins and you are beginning to live the life that he calls you to live. You can't do that on your own. You can't save yourself by turning from your sins. You need to come to Jesus Christ for him to break the power of your sins. And then you will be able to live the life he calls you to live, but not before then. And so the Lord says to you this morning, if you see your poverty, if you realize your guilt, and you know that you're helpless to do anything about it, even to turn from your sins and to trust in him, come to him that you might become rich. The Lord offers himself to you as a savior, and he says, trust in me and I will save you. And so trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and turn from your sins. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That is the gift of God. It's an absolute certainty for everyone who will come to him and trust in him. I hope by his grace you will trust in him this morning. Let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's uh, spend just a few moments asking God to apply his word to our lives this morning as we need it applied.